Uh, we have a special story to hear today. Sarah Krug is the CEO of Cancer 101 and is executive director of the Society for Participatory Medicine. And if there is a theme at all uh, that we have had this morning and uh, that we're going to continue to have, uh, it's about the voice of the patient, the voice of the family, the uh, growing opportunity, and I think now, as we've heard already, imperative for the participation of patients and families uh, in their care and in partnership, in collaborative partnership uh, with uh, physicians in the care system. So, Sarah, we're glad to have you here you. for what you will uh, share with us. Sarah's originally from Houston, managed to get out of there and uh, come to uh, study at Princeton, now lives in New York. Sarah. Thank you, thank you. So today I'm going to talk about amplifying the voice of the patient and co-designing healthcare for patients, with patients. And I'm going to start off by reading a few short stories. Once upon a time, there was a 13-year-old girl whose mother had overcome breast cancer several years prior. and had been in remission. She had gone in for a few follow-up tests as she was feeling a bit off and wanted to get a clean bill of health prior to a two-month globe-trotting trip with her children. She received the green light but called one last time before boarding a plane with her family because she knew something wasn't right. But once again, her complaints were dismissed. During each leg of the trip, she got a little more lethargic and attributed it to the long days of sightseeing. On the last leg of the trip, she no longer had the energy to walk and had to use a wheelchair during the return trip home, where she was rushed straight to the hospital. They were shocked to find she had stage four lung cancer at this point, had missed the early signs, including her complaints, and had neglected to order a CT scan or chest x-ray in a timely manner. 45 days after being diagnosed with lung cancer, she died at the ripe old age of 42, leaving behind her four children. The youngest was two. Once upon a time, there was a 24-year-old girl whose father had both cancer and diabetes. He had been admitted to the hospital after having a heart attack and was discharged once stabilized with an extensive list of medications. He was taking so many medications and needed someone to help him coordinate the complexities of his care. He really did not understand. He just wasn't feeling right and on several occasions tried to call the doctor for help, tried to get an appointment, tried to get someone to help him make sense of his medications. He ended up with a negative drug reaction as a result of incorrect drug dosages and fainted in a subway a few weeks after being discharged. Stuck in time, he wound up in a coma and died two weeks later at 51 years old. Once upon a time, there was a 29-year-old girl whose athletic husband was suddenly feeling extremely lethargic, so he went and saw his doctor. They found he had a low blood count and attribute it to a bout of anemia he shouldn't be concerned with. A few days went by, and he couldn't muster the energy to walk up steps at this point with incessant heart palpitations. Again, he visited his physician, who sent him away with nothing to be concerned with. The next day, his heart felt as if it were about to explode, and he went back and pleaded with the physician to fix it. Something wasn't right, and he couldn't just sit back and write it through. Annoyed with a nagging plea for help, his doctor sent him to get an EKG around the corner to appease his worries. And an hour later, it was the technician who refused to administer the test. She called an ambulance to have him rushed to the hospital before, because she noticed his lips had turned blue, and he appeared alarmingly lethargic. They found he had a severe internal bleed and had to give him an emergency blood transfusion caused by a golf ball-sized gastrointestinal stromal tumor. Thank goodness it was benign, but they claimed if he had waited any longer writing out his bout of anemia, he most likely would have died. And uh, that 13-year-old who lost her mother as a result of a medical error grew up to be that 24-year-old who lost her father as a result of a medical error, and that 24-year-old grew up to be that 29-year-old who almost lost her husband, and that 29-year-old um, grew up to be a 30-something who refuses to tell you her age up on stage. And um, their voices weren't heard at the time, but I'm here to tell their story. And I am tired of the issues in healthcare 
snatching my family members well before their time. I am angry, I am sad, I am perplexed, but I am hopeful that as we begin to amplify the voice of the patient, that what happened to me and my family will never happen to yours. Patients have a story to tell, and the patient's life expertise is just as important as the clinician's medical expertise, and until the two come together in that patient-doctor tango, we truly can't derive at positive patient outcomes. So aside from the convergence of the medical expertise the clinician brings to the table and the patient life expertise, we need to amplify the voice of the patient in the design, development, and enhancement of Thank you. In the design, the development, and enhancement of solutions that are geared to serve them. So resources, tools, policies, processes, clinical trial design, so we could bump those th 3 to 5 percent enrollment rates up, services. We need to include the patient front and center. Now to move beyond Now, to move beyond um, just my story, I wanted to share our story. And I was going to, uh, I launched a survey where I asked a very simple question. If you could wave a magic wand and change one thing about healthcare, aside from making it free, what would you change? And I got some really interesting answers, and I was going to put it into a fancy pie chart and bore you to tears, but instead, I uh, put it into a video it's a uh, disclaimer, I have no videography expertise, it's a homegrown video, so brace yourself. If you could play the video, please.
Thank you. So to illustrate the point of partnering with patients to design a solution that's geared towards solving one of their problems, I ran with one of the ideas that was cited in the video, which was banish the free show hospital gown. And I brought together a group of patients where we started to look at what's working with the hospital gown, which was next to null, and what's not working. Um, what, you know, with some of the redesigns, we also looked at what's working there, what's not. And um, we came up with a hybrid between a two-piece uh, kimono wrap top and basketball tearaway pants. And so I worked with a few fashion designers who sketched up a few prototypes. And then I had a patient stitch it for me in a day and a half, just to illustrate the point. Don't worry, I'm not going into the hospital gown business. But I'd like to introduce the lovely Megan Kivadar, who is going to model our beautiful hospital gown. Yes, she is Joe's daughter. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. So here's my napkin strategy in terms of participatory co-design. And I'll give you a prettier version of it. It's basically a six-step process where you collaborate with the patient. You will co-identify the, solution, the, uh, the um, issues and the priorities. You co-explore. You brainstorm solutions. Co-design, which is the creation phase. Co-implementation, which is the prototype phase. And then co-assessment, which is the continuous improvement phase. Again, very simple process, but involving patients every step of the way to ensure that their perspective is heard throughout. Another mechanism that I've created to amplify the voice of the patient is the patient shark tank. How many of you have watched the show, The Shark Tank on TV, where investors come in and um, evaluate different innovations, different, different business solutions? So the patient shark tank, the goal there is to demonstrate that the voice of the patient is just as important as the investor. So basically the way the patient shark tank works is that innovators, whether it's a pharmaceutical company, a startup company, a payer, a hospital, comes in and pitches their innovation to a panel of patients. Um, we've co-designed a scorecard that they use to assess those innovations that's broken out into 12 domains. And essentially, it's a great way for patients to provide perspective on the design, the development, the enhancement of a solution that's geared towards solving one of their problems. We've done 10 events so far. We're working on a virtual build of the patient shark tank. But it's a great way to amplify the voice of the patient. Um, another key issue that was cited in the video was I'm overwhelmed, information overload. Patients receive so much information as they're interfacing with the healthcare system, they're navigating the wild, wild west of the web, and they don't know where to go for credible information. So we took that problem and we worked with patients to co-design a solution that's in the works right now. Um, it's called Prescription to Learn, and basically it allows patients to search on the condition that they need, select the phase in the journey that they're in. So in this case, let's say they select newly diagnosed. They would then select the type of resource they're looking for, whether it's an online uh, resource, whether it's a mobile app, whether it's an online support community, live support community, whatever it might be. And then it provides them with a list of resources and support mechanisms to ensure that that patient has access to credible and validated information. It also allows them to see how other patients and caregivers have rated the resource, and it allows them to see how other clinicians uh, have also rated the resource. It also allows them to prescribe education. Uh, it allows clinicians to prescribe education to their patients and caregivers. So I want to circle back to the Magic Wand project for a minute. The survey link is actually still open. Um, the goal is to start to match up some of the problems that patients faced or cited in the video um, with some of the solutions that are out there. There are solutions out there, but oftentimes patients aren't aware of them. I actually often get requests from even a hospital where they're looking for a solution to solve a problem, and I'll try to connect the dots in an impromptu fashion. And so the idea of this health match is to start to connect the dots between the problems and solutions in a way that will um, allow everyone to, to see the information. So three key takeaways that I want to leave you with. Um, one is to embrace the patient life expertise. Listen to the patient, 
listen to the story they have to tell, arm them with the tools to succeed, amplify their voice, and integrate their stories into the equation. The second is to pave the path forward with patients front and center, patients as partner, uh, to co-design the future of healthcare. And the third is using a back-to-basics approach. We're out there solving complex issues, working on complex um, solutions, but at the same time, we've lost sight of some of the basic issues that patients have faced for decades. And so I urge you to circle back and ensure that we are accounting for those issues as well. Um, so this was the first time sharing my story to a thousand people. I'm not sure what I was thinking there. And I thank you for listening. Um, I, I feel like this was somewhat therapeutic um, conference therapy, although I think I deserved a couch instead of a chair, but I won't complain. But I do thank you for listening to my story. Thank you.